Welcome to the Travelog 5K AMA. Y'all submitted these questions, and I'm more than happy to answer them. I'll be doing most as a voiceover, but I thought it might be fun to give everyone a sneak peek using footage from the upcoming Escape to Paradise series. Timestamps to each question, as always, down below. Hello from Chicago O'Hare. Okay, so nobody asked this, but I think it's important to make clear. Yes, I am playing a bit of an exaggerated character in the videos. While I do have a snarky side, I'm normally a pretty chill, laid-back guy. This Q&A will mostly be my real true self, though I may slip into character if the situation really calls for it. It took me a while to figure out the tone I wanted for the channel. Go back to my super early videos and I'm just trying to be a Paul Stewart, Sam Chewy, or Jeb Brooks knockoff. My videos were terrible and boring, but I was figuring things out. I've definitely gone a bit too far on the humor side, making some rather inappropriate jokes. I think I have it dialed in to where I want it, but I'm always looking to refine and open to change. Sure, you may or may not like my videos or disagree, but I never want anyone to think they were generic or boring. Welcome to SeaTac. Matt Nav says, Congratulations on the 5K from a fellow small creator. Any plans to try any cool 5th Freedom routes? Love the quirky routes like Singapore from Barcelona to Milan, Emirates from La Carna to Malta, Ethiopian from Milan to Zurich, etc. Hi Matt Nav, yes, I also think 5th Freedom routes are really cool. I've thought about taking them before, and even had a poll up about it in 2019. But everyone voted for Air New Zealand instead. I think the reason I haven't taken any yet is just convenience. Singapore's routes to Europe are from Houston and JFK. Given that I'd have to book using Singapore miles to get business class and I'd need to position, it's just a bit of a pain. I was looking at LATAM's Madrid to Frankfurt, but that was cancelled. I have also considered Emirates, Ethiopian, and others next time I'm in Asia. The original plan for my Malta trip was to take Emirates from Cyprus to Malta, but I needed to change the timeline to spend more time in Italy with my family, and Emirates downgraded that route to the 777-200. I've yet to review Emirates, and with their constant evaluations, who knows at this point, and I didn't want that to be my first experience with them. Funny you should mention Singapore between Barcelona and Milan. I came very, very close to booking that for this summer, actually. I ended up going with a more direct routing and it's hopefully on a very interesting wet lease with another airline I've really been wanting to cover. So to answer your question, yes, I will absolutely try and fly 5th Freedom routes when I can. But at the end of the day, it's my money, my miles, and my vacation days. I will go a little out of my way to try something new for the channel if it's not too much of an inconvenience. But the primary purpose of me taking all these flights remains... My actual vacation, not the channel. Hello Los Angeles. Power to Maps has a couple of questions. What's my worst travel experience? Sure, things have definitely gone wrong. I've never had to divert, but I've had delays, timeouts, weather incidents that have required an overnight layover. All in all, though, I think I've been pretty lucky so far. I think if I had to think of a single trip where everything went wrong, it was a trip to Europe I took with my family. I think it was 1995. The plan was to fly into London, take the Eurostar to the Thales to the ICE to Germany, then the TGV to France and fly out of Paris. But this was summer in Europe, so that means strikes. First, the tube in London was on strike. The Eurostar was delayed by a day as SNCF rail workers were on strike. Deutsche Bahn was also having strikes when I was in Germany. Then flying out of Paris, there was a work slowdown at Charles de Gaulle Airport. Check-in took three and a half hours, and we nearly missed the flight. It all worked out in the end with some revisions on the fly, but it definitely was quite the parade of issues. When you hear me making snarky comments about European transit strikes, it stems from that and from subsequent experiences. Any plans to visit the Balkans or Albania? Well, having been to Greece and Croatia, the Adriatic is beautiful. I love it there. I was thinking of popping over to Montenegro on my last Croatia trip, but there were still COVID requirements and additional headaches. I tend to move around a lot on my trips, and it seems that for the Balkans, you really just need two weeks in a car. Which is fine, there's nothing wrong with that, just perhaps not immediate on my list. 
I have looked at taking Air Serbia into Belgrade and using that as a hub for flights, but honestly, it hasn't gotten past the idea stage. So I'm definitely interested. It's just on the list and will likely be a few years away. Good morning from Nandi. How do you stay connected during your trips all over the world? Does your plan include roaming, or do you get local SIM cards or use an eSIM app? Well, that's definitely something that's changed over the years. I remember calling cards and payphones. Then I had a special European GSM phone I could swap out local SIM cards in when I lived in Europe. When I first started the channel, I used Verizon Travel Pass, since Verizon is my main provider. For $10 a day, you use your phone like normal. You get half a gigabyte of data per day. But that gets real expensive real fast. And after the half gigabyte, you get throttled into oblivion to the point where Google Maps won't load. Not ideal when you're trying to navigate around a foreign country. Today, I use Google Fi. Is it the cheapest option? Not at all. I leave it on pause when I'm not traveling and activate it when I do. It's $20 a month for calls and $10 per gigabyte up to six gigabytes, after which it's free. So it's a maximum of $80 a month, i.e. eight days of Verizon Travel Pass, without the limits. Again, local SIM cards will be cheaper, but they are often data only, and I like the ability of making calls in an emergency without needing Skype or something. But with my Google Fi eSIM, I just turn it on when I land and I'm good to go. No registering local SIMs. No worrying about changing SIMs when I move countries. For example, my around the world trip, I had my phone on in Hong Kong, Cambodia, Thailand, Italy, the Czech Republic, Germany, and Canada. Google Fi let me move between countries without even thinking about it. Now, I am well aware this usage pattern is against the terms of service for Google Fi. They want you to use it primarily in the US locally. I turn it on a few days early and rack up some US time in hopes that it buys me time. I'm sure they'll terminate my account eventually, but we'll see when that happens. Hello from Tavayuni. Eos D. Brickashaw asks about my day job. I know in a previous video, Allegiant, you mentioned your occupation is to find the economic underpinnings of major companies. I was just curious, as I'm a young professional, on how you got my start, etc. Don't have to give the specifics or privacy reasons, but just curious about your professional background was all. And MelSo76 says, Hello fellow economist, to what extent do you think working as an economist has helped you make better flight reports? So yes, to back up a bit, I am an economist. I do have a PhD. While I thought about academia, I've always worked in the private sector. Now, that doesn't mean you need an econ PhD to do the work that I do. We hire plenty of kids right out of college, folks with masters and MBAs or other graduate degrees. In general, we look for individuals who are critical thinkers, can work independently, and are capable of creative solutions. Some sort of programming skills in Python, SAS, Data, R, MATLAB, etc. are also a must. I'm at the stage in my career where I'm not the one doing most of the coding, but I need to be able to review it, even in languages I'm less familiar with. That's my current job. My last job, where I was when I made that Allegiant video, was doing slightly different work related to international tax. Without getting too technical, companies get taxed where there are profits, and profits should happen where value is being created. How much value comes out of a factory in Germany, intellectual property parked in Ireland, or a distributor in New Zealand? Well, that's an economic question, and hence why I was helping out with that. I gave perhaps the biggest clue of where I worked in my video about airline stocks, where I mentioned several stocks that I wasn't allowed to own. There's very few reasons why that might be the case, and very few companies with such restrictions. Hell, members of Congress can insider trade to their heart's content. And if you can figure out what each airline stock I couldn't own had in common, well, then you've got your answer. Again, I don't work for that company anymore. As for how the fact I'm an economist influences my flight reviews, I, I need to think about that. I'm not sure it does directly. I only made one video really getting into the nitty gritty of economic theory and <laughs> nobody watched that. The video on Allegiant is more of a business perspective. Every time I get a new client, I have all my associates read the 10K for context to understand the company before we get started. Hell, <laughs> I have a 10K up on my work machine right now. 
While I don't think that my econ background necessarily makes better videos, I do think that my academic and client-facing background does. I've written and reviewed plenty of papers, and a big part of my job is managing clients and selling them work. I walk into a room knowing that they don't care and they don't want to buy what I'm selling. It's my job to make them care. That applies to making YouTube videos, honestly. Now, that doesn't mean that I use over-the-top, full-on ADHD brain rainbow barf at the screen. We're gonna fly on this jet that costs half a million dollars per flight. And we're also gonna fly on this $25,000 private jet, a $10,000 first class seat, a blimp, and so much more. But I write my scripts down. I edit them. I use chapters so you can skip around. I have a distinct introduction, thesis statement, relevant sections with supporting evidence, and a conclusion. That likely does come from my life experience. And here, I'm gonna throw just a little bit of friendly shade at my fellow content creators. I see the other videos my audience watches. They are often much more successful channels. Who am I to criticize them? Well, <laughs> too bad I am. On the one hand, you have content with no narration, no plot, and just text at the bottom of the screen. No offense to these creators, but I just can't watch that. Why? I don't care. They didn't make me care. On the other end of the spectrum, there is the character or narrative-driven content. Now, I'll save some of my criticisms of that style for when I talk about face reveals. But the general gist is, it's watch me take this flight or train. Watch me experience something that you want to or can't. Me, me, me. But the downside of this content style is the lack of structure and again, not making me care. So I'm gonna pick on Noel Phillips here. Again, far, far more successful than I'll ever be. I genuinely wanted a review of Fiji business class, not for me to crib, but because I'm actually about to fly it and wanted to know what to expect. This video has 220,000 views, more than I've ever reached on a single video. So clearly he knows what he's doing as a content creator. The description is talking about established titles and their holiday sale. Wow, that's uh, really helpful and topical about Fiji Airways business class, thanks. The thumbnail is catchy enough and boy, looks pretty negative. Huh, I always get a lot of flack when I complain about an airline. I wonder if he has the same problem. It's a 35 minute video. I know I'm gonna struggle with attention before I even get started. Again, my goal, what I want to get out of watching this video is a concrete and actionable review of Fiji Airways business class on the A350. He doesn't say that's what it is, but I know that from the thumbnail. But sure, let's watch it. I, this does nothing. There are not even any chapters. It's all just this mush. Alright, Los Angeles, California. Finally, some action. Time to head across to the international terminal because we've got a really cool plane to catch tonight. Okay, finally we can start. Nope, 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 still just introduction. Really tonight, and there are a multitude of airlines that will fly you non-stop from here in LAX across the Pacific to Australia. But you know me, I don't like Nobody cares. Fine, I'm, I'm just gonna start randomly clicking around the video. Let's see. And socks not as cool as my Noel Phillips socks, which of course you can get in the merch store at noelphillips.com. Okay. Lord now, I'm Lord Noel Phillips. Well, you've been a lord for a long time, mate, but not that kind. Not, not that kind of lord, no. Thanks to established titles, you can refer to me, please, as my lord, Lord Noel Phillips. Great, established titles. That was a scam, you know. Very, very restless night's sleep. All the music playing. So you forgot noise cancelling headphones. Why not just say that it's important to bring noise cancelling headphones? Um, go into English at the top. So there we go, we've got miles per hour and miles to run and stuff like that and the altitude in feet, it's just how we like it, of course. Uh <sighs> Jesus Christ, get on with it. It's a moving map. I'm not five. 
yeah, loads of exciting Aus Aussie Av Geek action to be coming up um, over sort of the next few videos, really. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I'm here to tell you right now, we don't care. Let me tell, right, let me tell you, <laughs> we don't care. What, what did I just watch? I got nothing out of it. You like the food, but you forgot to pack noise canceling headphones so couldn't sleep. Seriously, that's, that's all I retained. As we say, that should have been an email not a 35 minute meeting or a video in this case. Again, he and others are far, far bigger creators than I'll ever be. I'm not being critical out of jealousy here. People clearly like this content, but that's just not how I think, let alone how I want to make content. Sure, I make jokes and entertain, but at the end of the day, I want to provide value, concise and actionable information to my audience and respect their time. And that likely does come from my economic consulting background. But you don't necessarily need that. Internet Shaquille is a great example of get to the point style in the cooking genre. Welcome to Queenstown. Chase the G asks, how much do I like the country that is missing from the map on its government 404 page not found link? I'm impressed. That's exactly where it's from and where I'm headed this trip. New Zealand. I really like New Zealand. I'm on my way there right now after all. Since I started the channel in 2018, this is my third trip there, and I would have gone back sooner had it not been for COVID. I tell people Japan is my favorite place to visit, but I haven't been back there since 2017, again due to the pandemic. I guess actions speak louder than words. I've said to my friends and family I'd love to make New Zealand an annual thing. It's really, really far. The scenery is absolutely stunning. The wine is without exception fantastic. So is the farm to table food. I love nature and wildlife, and the kia is by far my favorite bird. And the people are almost exclusively wonderful. The only mean kiwis I've ever run into are in the comments section of my videos. Now you might say, hey, Travelog, you like fjords and hiking? Go to Norway. You haven't been there yet on the channel. <laughs> Well, about that. Stay tuned. Alexi asks about the direction of business class or other classes of travel. I've got no crystal ball, but I unfortunately think it's going to be towards further product segmentation, premium economy, and the unbundling of business class. We're already seeing this with Iberia and Qatar having basic business class. Zip Air is doing a la carte business class, especially with the decline of post-pandemic of real business class travelers, they'll want to fill the seats with people paying with their own money. And everyone is frantically refitting premium economy into their aircraft. I don't inherently have an issue with premium economy, though I personally have never paid for it transatlantic or pacific. But improvements to premium economy often come at the cost of regular economy, and I've always seen premium economy as nothing new, but just what economy used to be 20 years ago. They'll try and constantly nickel and dime you, upsell you, and it will be as annoying as hell. And I'll sure be bitching about it on the channel every time. In terms of revolutions in travel, I think Air New Zealand's economy beds are an interesting concept, but I doubt they will pan out. Sky Couch makes a lot more sense, and it's easier to monetize. Business class and first class are converging, and I expect most airlines to reduce or eliminate true first class. Now, with business class, you can have dine on demand and a door. What else do you need? I'm also at a bit of a loss on how else they can improve. The innovation I really want is a return to supersonic travel. That would be cool. Airplanes are flying slower today than they were 30 years ago for fuel economy reasons. If and when they can crack that and make it economical and environmentally friendly, that would be a real game changer. And no, I'm not having high hopes for Boo. Okay, let's talk about the points guy. Alec asks why I hate the points guy, and Kuladi Crew asks the more relevant question about why you should hate the points guy. Okay, let's separate this between Brian the Man and TPG as a company. I do not personally know Brian. I've never met him. But I was part of an invite-only travel hacker group a few years ago and several members were writers for TPG. Every one of them hated Brian. He was apparently insufferable. 
Nobody respected him. He was seen as a spoiled man-child whose whims you needed to entertain. People were just there for a paycheck. Then there's the 2020 Business Insider article. Go read it. I don't need to repeat all of the allegations of drug use, sexual misconduct with employees, or a toxic workplace. They are all alleged in the report. Most more serious Miles and Points people really despise the Points guy. I think there are two reasons for this. One, he attracts a lot of new people to the hobby, which isn't inherently bad. However, you, the reader, are the product. Gee, this trip sure looks fun, and all I need to do is sign up for a credit card? Wow, and the link to do so is conveniently right here. They earn literal millions of dollars a year in referral bonuses. Their goal is to get you to sign up for a credit card using their links. Period. Is there a better offer elsewhere? Doesn't matter. Clink the link that's not as good because TPG gets the money. Wow, this card is pretty terrible. Doesn't matter. TPG will spin it in a positive light because they want you to click the link and sign up. Access media is also vital to their business, which can and has led to conflicts of interest. There was a very anti-Marriott post that was killed by Brian himself because he wanted to attend a party hosted by Marriott. There's a phony award show that's seen as nothing more than a vanity project. Negative changes are spun as a positive. Chase the Bank announced the Chase Sapphire Reserve on his blog. That was the press release. You, the traveling reader, are not the focus and never will be. You are the product. The second reason is what TPG did to the Miles and Points community. TPG was first bought by Bankrate and later Red Ventures. And what happens when Red Ventures wanted to dominate the Miles and Points space? They bought up all the competition and killed it. Million Miles Secrets used to be a really practical, helpful blog. Then it got bought by TPG. Darius and Emily got a divorce and left. Now it posts nothing but bogus credit card reviews to get you to sign up with their links. Mommy Points was shut down and she went to go write for TPG. Then Drew from Travel is Free in 2019. In fact, rather than my words, I'm just going to read some of the comments from his post announcing that he was joining TPG. TPG is a shill site, with few nuggets of good content, and TPG don't outweigh the endless shilling. I stopped paying attention to TPG long ago, viewing it as crap for the masses. I find that the majority of TPG content isn't great. There's way too much pushing a credit card, sloppy content, and even bad advice that drowns out some of the good. While I view TPG as utterly lacking in integrity, it's naive to believe that Red Ventures and Brian Kelly will give you the same creative control you've had on your own, or that they really care about readers. They care about credit card conversions and ad revenue. Keep in mind Brian pulled back an article that was critical of Marriott because he didn't want to damage their relationship with the company. This is the same company that pumps a zillion affiliate links within any post they can, lied about never accepting free flights, and pays fast and loose with advertising disclosures. TPG, along with Million Mile Secrets, are just conduits for pimping credit cards and recycled unoriginal content. Ten reasons why the Chase Sapphire Reserve is great, and here's why you should sign up for the Amex Platinum now. Post week after week and month after month with five plus referral links built into every post. Hobby is dead and TPG killed it out of his own greed. I feel like my favorite microbrewer has just been bought by Anheuser-Busch. At TPG, all your posts will push Capital One and Amex Delta cards like crazy. Like others said, TPG is a lacking originality and is just pushing credit cards. Congrats on selling out. TPG is the lowest denominator in a shill. For you to join him shows complete lack of judgment. Hopefully you got a hell of a lot of money up front because I don't see it being worthwhile for you in any other way. Such a shame. Good luck with your soul. TPG is garbage. TPG is just a credit card pusher. You have met the enemy and he is you now. This is disgusting and I'm very disappointed to hear it. Your reputation will go the way of TPG, and deservedly so. I hope you got a big pile of money for this. I've seen this movie a few times before and I know how it ends. Okay, I'm not gonna read that one. I have never read a single useful post on TPG and probably haven't been to his site in years. All of the content is absolute garbage. There's a lot more, but you get the gist. Again, I could go into a much longer tirade about the site and how immoral some of its practices are, but I think I've made my point. What blogs do I recommend then? Well, View from the Wing and One Mile at a Time are usually pretty good, but they do have a minimum number of THIS CARD IS AMAZING sponsored posts per month for the referral money. I've gotten good at spotting it, but it's still annoying. One Mile at a Time has a referral link for selling life miles that he just won't shut up about, and buying life miles is not a good idea for most people. The blogs with the most integrity are Doctor of Credit and Frequent Miler. Doctor of Credit doesn't do referral links, period, so you can actually trust them to not be biased. Frequent Miler does have referral links, but their best offers page is just that. They will put a link to the best offer, 
even if it isn't their own. For example, they did this with the Amex Gold with the Resi offer, TPG didn't. You always know you'll be getting the best possible deal with them. I really appreciate that honesty with their audience and use their links when I don't have a friends. Their podcasts and challenges are also pretty great as well. I've never met Nick, Greg, Tim, Carrie, or Steven, but they seem like nice people. Speaking of credit cards, the next two questions are about those. Cool Addy Crew again asks, what cards do you normally use for points and priority? Amex, Chase. And John asks, in your absolutely non-legal financial opinion, what are the best starter cards if you're trying to get into miles and points? I am very, very hesitant to recommend credit cards to people. Primarily because personal finance is no joking matter. Credit card debt ruins lives. Offering a credit card to someone can be like offering an addict heroin. I also find that shilling of cards to be really, really slimy, CTPG. But oh, that applies to YouTube, Stefan, Sifu, and Sebi. But okay, completely frankly here, what cards would I get? I'll go back to what I said in the video I made about credit cards. You are asking the wrong question. Where do you want to go and how do you want to get there? We can pick cards after that. I fundamentally do not believe in the hobby of accumulating points with no tangible goal in mind. Each point you earn should be towards a specific set of redemptions. I'm going to just talk about transferable currencies now, since that's what you should be focusing on. That's Chase, Capital One, Built, Amex, and City. Most blogs recommend the Chase Sapphire Preferred as your first travel credit card. Yes, there are reasons like 524. Also because Chase pays a lot for those referrals. While the sign-on bonus can be good, 2x on travel and 3x on dining just isn't competitive these days. Then there's the issue of what to do with Chase points. There's really only Hyatt and United, both of which are continually being devalued. There's Flying Blue, Aeroplan, Emirates, all the different Avios, and Virgin, but those aren't unique. Don't get me wrong. I have a Chase Sapphire Reserve, Freedom Flex, Freedom Unlimited, and an Ink Cash, not to mention several co-branded cards, but it's not my favorite. Capital One kind of came out of nowhere when they introduced transferable points, especially when it went one-to-one. -one. They have basic programs like Aeroplan Version and JetBlue, as well as more advanced like Life Miles and Turkish Airways. The one thing it's missing is hotel points, a core is just not worth it. But 2x on everything, the Capital One Venture or Venture X is a no-brainer to me. It's especially good as a player two card, hand it to your spouse and they don't need to think about what's the right card to use. Pair it with the $0 annual fee saver one for three points on dining, entertainment and grocery. That's my best beginner combination for someone right there. Built is a new one designed for renters. 2X on travel and 3X on dining and no annual fee, plus 1X on your rent if you make five transactions a month. There is way too much VC money behind this venture, but I'm milking it for all it's worth. They have amazing partners, including United, American, what? And Hyatt. If you rent, it is a no-brainer. The only downside is the fact that the bank behind it is Wells Fargo, which is always somewhere between hilariously incompetent and downright evil. Speaking of hilariously incompetent, Citibank. I'll be honest, it's solid, but I've never really gotten into it. They do transfer to Choice Hotels in a Wyndham, however, besides the usual airlines, which are fine, but nothing amazing or unique. That leaves Amex. I like Amex. They have some great cards, but some of the earning rates are a bit behind the times. The Everyday Preferred gets one and a half points everywhere with 30 transactions a month, or City and Capital One have 2x. The earning on the gold card for restaurants is good, as is travel on the Platinum, but the travel protection on other cards is better. The real winner for Amex is a a which none of the others have and is a bit hard to use. Sure, grab a gold card or a platinum, hell even a green, but I no longer put the bulk of my spend on Amex. I really dislike the coupon book nature of their various credits on the cards. Sure, an expert can get maximum value from them, milk them for all they're worth with no lifetime language. As a beginner, it can be a bit of a pain. Aloha from Waikiki. Daniel asks, what is my flavor airline? 
flavor? That would have to be the Air McDonald's flight from Topa to Flavortown. Favorite airline? Hmm, now that's a tough one. The first international business class flight I took was on ANA. I was absolutely floored by the food and service. It's always going to have a very special place in my heart. My favorite single airline flight was Etihad Apartments. I absolutely love that flight, though Etihad as an airline sure has its issues. If we define favorite as the one I feel most comfortable taking, that I book without hesitating, it's Southwest. Now I know people are going to think it's gone to hell. I was there for the meltdown. Perhaps they can't be saved. Yes, they have no in-seat entertainment or even reserved seats. But they are my second most flown airline, and I've always just felt a difference with their crews. Not exciting, I know, but it's the truth. They are on very thin ice with me, though. I've got a flight to Denver on them this month. We'll see how that goes. The one I'd not go on again, that I've covered on the channel, Air India for sure. Dear lord, that flight was something else. My first introduction to India, and it was quite the shock for sure. Of all time though, that would have to be Sabena. Only flew them once round trip to Europe. Dear lord, it was a terrible experience. Cancelled flights for days requiring complete replanning of the trip. Showing up at the airport and having no record that my dad even existed on the return flight. It was a complete train wreck of an airline, and I haven't flown on Brussels Airlines because they are what was left over. Alex asks what my favorite part of making the videos is. This may sound a bit odd, but my favorite part of the process is planning the trip. And that actually isn't just making for videos. I enjoy planning trips as much, if not slightly more, than actually taking the trip. I search for award space while I'm waiting for the bus. Look up interesting flights like Fifth Freedom or curious aircraft swaps. Hell, I'll even be planning the next trip while on vacation. Yeah, it's a problem, I know. This also applies to the jokes, memes, and even the music. I often have particular shots or sequences in mind before I take the flight. I've got an upcoming landing this summer, and I really want to play this. No idea if the footage will even match. I'll also sometimes even pre-write the jokes. There's a joke I've been wanting to tell since I started the channel that hopefully I'll be able to finally use. But tonight, we died in hell! And of course, I'll be using this one shortly. This is getting out of hand. Now there are two of them. I'll be the first person to say that I could definitely improve in the actual shooting of the video. I think I've greatly improved since 2018, but there's definitely more to do. I tend to treat each big trip as the start of a new season and try and noticeably improve the quality of my videos. One comparison you could make is the first New Zealand trip in 2018, the second trip in 2019, and then this trip in 2023. Hopefully the picture quality and shot composition has improved. Then there's the script writing. I actually put a lot of thought into it. I don't just say where I'm going or regurgitate stream of consciousness into the camera. I think it's pretty fun. I'll take loose notes as I go, then write the scripts on my iPhone, iPad, or Mac. I'll record the audio using a Blue Yeti in Audacity, and use DaVinci Resolve to edit the videos on my PC. Definitely another area for improvement, but I do enjoy it. I'm no professional editor, so it may take me upwards of 5 to 12 hours to edit a single video. The thing I hate the most is thumbnails. I know I'm really bad at it. I've tried a host of different styles, but it's hard when I'm not photoshopping in backgrounds or superimposing my head in the frame. I'm now using Affinity Photo for that. Okay, let's do this. Jack Jack and Joe ask about a face reveal when. Well, I'm not gonna say never, because never is forever, and forever is a long, long time. But I'm not planning to. Why? Well, it's because I'm just too goddamn handsome. If I were on screen, man or woman, gay or straight, you wouldn't be able to concentrate. I mean, I'm quite straight, and I can't concentrate on the flight review when Dennis is talking. Such a fine Australian specimen. Okay, in all seriousness, there are two reasons why I don't show my face. It's not about personal privacy, it's about creative choice and professional implications. 
I talked earlier about different styles of flight reviews. It's either blank text or me, 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 me. Well, that's not who I am. It's just not. I know I'd likely get more clicks and views if I made silly faces on the thumbnails, but I see them and all I can hear is, I have a bad case of diarrhea. 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 My arguments, opinions, hell, even my jokes should speak for themselves. I don't want you to come along in a day of my life. I'm actually an introvert, you know. Channels like Life of Boris are amazing, hilarious, and have not had a face reveal. Girlfriend reviews was fine before they showed their faces. Hell, there's been channels that I liked less after a face reveal. The second reason is professional considerations. Look, I love making videos. It's really fun. It's been a creative outlet during some really dark times in my life. I'm even making money from it. Last year, I made about $2,000 in ad revenue. That's awesome, and I'm not taking that for granted. But to put that in context with some rounding, that's 1% of my day job? That's not intended as a brag. That's just to illustrate the relative magnitudes here. As much fun as I have on this channel, I will not jeopardize my career. I'd be crazy to. We live in an online world. In my line of work, I am the product. It's my CV and skills that go into the proposals. So the question is, when you Google me, what would happen if this came up? Would you sign a multi-million dollar contract with this guy? Grant a government security clearance? No, no you wouldn't. And that's no dig against Scott here, but I can't do that. What about this? Or this? Yeah, that's not just an issue with potential clients, that will get you a call from HR. I don't feel like we should make Mexican jokes because people will get upset. Oh, no Mexican jokes at all. I don't think so. What, not even Juan? Not even Juan. Like it or not, we live in a very delicate professional climate. Seemingly innocuous acts or jokes can get you fired. Look, I personally don't have an issue with the OK sign, but it's officially classified as hate speech now. If a photo of me doing this went public, I could be fired. Like it or hate it, agree with it or not, it is the daily reality in corporate America. I do often make off-color jokes, and I know that I'm walking a fine line sometimes. It's not some great big secret who I am. Plenty of my current and former co-workers know about the channel. It's just that little extra bit of plausible deniability that's important to me at this stage. It also is possible that at some point I'll need to pull down content to keep an air of impartiality. God knows I've said my fair share of criticism of various airlines and trains. But I now do quite a bit of work in the transportation space. If all of the content for a particular airline or Amtrak suddenly goes down, it's likely because I'm either bidding on work or working for that client. It would be bad of me to just bash them online. It's a very well-known fast rail project out in a western state that I'm probably not going to talk about ever. When it's up and running and my team's no longer working for them, then sure. But it's high profile and controversial enough and adding my voice to it is more risk than it's worth. Hopefully y'all can understand. And that's it! Thanks for all the questions, it was really fun! And there definitely was a lot of stuff y'all didn't ask about my life for next time. Should we do this again at 7.5k? 10k? Hopefully that would be sooner than another five years. Thanks everyone for making this channel what it is, and I'll see you all in Escape to Paradise.